Good afternoon. The remarkable thing about our keynote speaker is what an understatement it would be to introduce him as simply the senior senator from the great state of Texas. Our conference today focuses on federalism, executive power, and separation of powers. And Senator Cornyn is a one-man tour through all branches of representative government, state and federal, entrusted by the people and his peers again and again and again to wield that responsibility with restraint, judgment, discretion, and integrity. At 32, he ran for and won an open state district judge seat in San Antonio. And in the mid-1980s, it was unheard of for a Republican to win that bench. Six years later, Senator Cornyn was elected to the Texas Supreme Court. And in 1990, it was almost unheard of for a Republican to win a statewide seat. And we should never forget that it is John Cornyn and the men and women that swept into office with him in those years are the reason that conservative government in Texas is first a model to the rest of the country, and second, something that we almost take for granted here almost 30 years later. In 1996, Senator Cornyn was elected Attorney General of Texas, and that win was not just unheard of, he was the first Republican to win that office since Reconstruction. John Cornyn was first elected to the United States Senate in 2002 and has twice been reelected, most recently in 2014. I believe he has literally never lost an election for any campaign uh, for office, either primary or general. He now serves on the Senate committees of Intelligence, Finance, and Judiciary and let's recall just one legislative victory this year. As a member of the Judiciary Committee in the week before the key vote, when it seemed clear that Democrats would try to filibuster the nomination of Neil Gorsuch to the United States Supreme Court, John Cornyn resolutely stated, this is their last gasp from trying to prevent him from being confirmed, but they won't, and Judge Gorsuch will be confirmed this week one way or another. And so it came to pass. <laughs> Senator Cornyn now serves as the majority whip in the Senate, the second highest ranking position in the Senate Republican Conference. And he would tell you, I think, that he likes sunshine and transparency on legislative process and on government programs. Shockingly, he also likes to actually read bills and consider them before they're voted out of committee or off the Senate floor. And his efforts to get Obamacare put back in the bottle have been a heroic 24-7 effort recently and in the recent past and over the past many years. Senators who sit on the sidelines make that task nearly impossible. But to the contrary, he has always been the man at the forefront, whatever the issue, the one helping to lead the fight, to plan it strategically, and to work for it relentlessly. John Cornyn's is a life of public service. His father was a B-17 pilot in World War II who made his career in the Air Force. Senator Cornyn was born here in Houston, largely raised in San Antonio, where he also went to college. He has been married to his wonderful wife, Sandy, for 37 years, and they have two amazing daughters. And so it is with understatement that I return to where I began. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the senior senator from the great state of Texas, John Cornyn. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Charles, thank you for that uh, very kind introduction. And as I always say, it's great to be introduced by a friend. <laughs> Charles is um, the kind of lawyer that exemplifies what I consider to be the best attributes of members of the bar. Somebody who believes in serving his clients diligently, somebody who believes in educating the public about the, the role of the law in our lives and in our constitutional government is important, and I know he's an adjunct at U of H. 
and somebody who works uh, with uh, Senator Cruz and I on our Federal Judicial Evaluation Committee to make sure that we select the best and the brightest judicial nominees to the White House and work to get them confirmed. In fact, um, when I was Attorney General, I was looking for the next Solicitor General of the, uh, of the state of Texas, and I turned to Charles and asked him if he would be interested in the job. Uh, I take some comfort that uh, he declined uh, for a higher purpose uh, because of family, but uh, that gives you an idea of what I think about Charles Eskridge. Uh, he's an outstanding human being and a great lawyer. Thank you, Charles. Well, with the Republican in the White House and so many judicial vacancies in Texas, you can imagine how hard Senator Cruz and I and our Federal Judicial Evaluation Committee have been working trying to help the White House vet nominees for the federal courts. Senator Cruz and I decided to uh, make the uh, Judicial Evaluation Committee a bipartisan committee, or at least keep it after President Obama was in office, and I think that's lent credibility to the process because we are literally looking for the best people, uh, not necessarily people with an agenda. In fact, frankly, I'm not too interested in judges who've already decided what the outcome of contested cases will be before they hear the, hear the case. But um, so thank you and, uh, the, to the Federal Society for the great work you all have done with people like Judge Gorsuch, starting at the top of the food chain, of the judicial food chain, all the way down to the, uh, the federal district bench and certainly at the circuit court level as well. Uh, FedSoc is, uh, is the go-to organization uh, for our side of the aisle, my side of the aisle, when it comes to judicial nominees because of the, of the diligence that you've demonstrated in identifying good people and your fidelity uh, to the principles of the Constitution and the separation of powers. So I want to start by rewinding the clock a little bit back to the 1980s. Think loud music, bell bottoms, and big hair. That's back when the uh, Federalist Societies was started back in 1982. I was practicing law in San Antonio, Texas, defending doctors in uh, medical malpractice cases, by and large, in an office that wasn't very far from the Alamo. It was early in my law career, of course, and like some of you here today, like all of us as young professionals, uh, I wondered what the future, what my future would hold. With time, things started to become clearer, and career opportunities presented themselves, and my path became clear, as I say. But as I grew up professionally, I noticed that the Federalist Society did as well. And look at where you are now. It's flattering enough that FedSoc has been recognized for years by some of the conservative patron saints like uh, Ronald Reagan, jurists like Clarence Thomas, just to, name, just to name one, and of course, many, many, many others. And it's also recognized as a gold standard, as I indicated earlier, when it comes to vetting federal judicial nominees. What's so remarkable, though, is that because of your refreshing approach to differences, even liberals sometimes sing your praises. That's because FedSoc never shies away from a good, honest debate, something the left avoids at all costs. And the left is worried, believe me. Listen to Mark Lilla, a liberal political philosopher, what he said about the Federalist Society as recently as last month. He said, this one organization has revolutionized the way that law is taught and interpreted in this country, and therefore how we are governed. Ladies and gentlemen, that's a big deal. Through your meetings and conferences and your debates and your influence, you are shaping the way that our country is governed. That deserves a pat on the back. You are definitely ruffling feathers. And it's official. The left is afraid, very, very afraid. But how we are governed is a big deal, as I say. I've always believed that one of the, that on the big important questions in our country, who decides is the most important question of all. It matters a lot, whether it's the individual, it's the elected representatives of the people, or it's life-tenured 
politically unaccountable federal judges. And I'm pleased to say that due in part to your efforts, our side has been winning the fight, arguing for a, an approach to um, judicial decision-making that has that fidelity to the Constitution and is consistent with the founding principles. And we saw in the last presidential election one of the most incredible upsets in U.S. history, where the choice over who would be the next person to nominate vacancies to the Supreme Court of the United States, I'm convinced, drove many people to the polls. Well, now, with the presidency and executive power specifically is the theme of today's conference, and we'll talk a little bit more about the last election in a minute. But right now, and I, I want to pause and mention the anniversary of a major executive action uh, that we celebrated yesterday. Well, you history buffs out there probably already know this, but it's the Emancipation Proclamation. So 155 years ago yesterday, President Lincoln signed the original version that every grade schooler has heard about, or at least I hope they've heard about. It freed the slaves of the Confederacy. Lincoln, of course, justified the Emancipation Proclamation as a fit and necessary war measure. The Constitution, of course, made him commander-in-chief, and it is constitutionally significant that the proclamation was confined to the states actually in rebellion. And, of course, later it became permanent with the adoption of the 13th Amendment. Well, you're wondering why I brought this up. That was a long time ago. Um, but we still have presidents, and we still have disagreements about the scope of executive power. American presidents, like Lincoln, still sometimes take, a bold, take bold and unprecedented actions, exercising the full measure of their authority under the Constitution. Sometimes they have to. Other times, they do it because they want to. But either way, Lincoln actually helps put us in this, puts this question in larger, greater context. Now, I've been fortunate enough to serve the state of Texas and Washington during three presidential administrations. I've known three presidents personally, and I've worked with them all, or done my best to do so. And in case anyone's wondering, I wish I could blame my white hair on my service in Washington, but actually I had that back when Charles said I ran for judge at the ripe old age of 32. <laughs> I actually waited until the day I turned 32 to file because I figured that gave me more gravitas. <laughs> but the story I want to tell you is not about the three men who I have served with, um, they in the White House while I've been in the Senate. It's instead to talk about each, how each one of them have used executive power. And in telling that story, I want to explain why I think that not all robust conceptions of executive power are alike. Far from it. Any discussion of executive power, of course, is also a discussion about legislative power. You can't have one without the other. Article one is Congress, my colleagues and I in the House and the Senate our job is to make the law. That's pretty basic. Article two is the president. And as we all know from the Youngstown case that we read in law school, the president's power to see the laws are faithfully executed refutes the idea he is to be a lawmaker. And I quote, well, we take these as truisms, but the founders actually designed a system where powers differed depending on the context. Take the presidency of George W. Bush the first part of my story. Well, I came to the Senate in 2002, um, almost a year after 9-11, that Tuesday morning that we all remember. That memory will never quite go away. During my first term in the Senate, President Bush interpreted his authority quite broadly in order to protect our country. The threat, of course, was different from that that uh, President Lincoln was addressing. We had global terrorist networks and the possibility of follow-on attacks that created a very, quite a sense of extreme urgency. And because of what has aptly been called a failure of imagination, most of America was simply unaware of the malevolent threat which operated in the shadows and was capable of inflicting massive harm without armies and without guns. Now, the Constitution gives the president substantial power over foreign affairs, as we all know. 
national security and defense because he's the commander in chief. The framer knew that these responsibilities required, and I quote, decision, activity, secrecy, and dispatch. Congress, in contrast, is not designed to act like that, trust me. <laughs> well, eventually the courts and Congress pushed back some on President Bush's authority and demanded that he seek congressional approval for some of the surveillance and detention and interrogation authority that he assumed in a, during a time of emergency. Crisis measures were acceptable for a time, but even as Lincoln, um, after a while, the uh, congressional branch uh, decided to have its say. By the time President Bush ended his second term, he finally had buy-in from the other branches, but had to scale back some of those measures and put others on a bigger consensus footing. So when he finally passed the baton on to his successor, our national security was, I believe, stronger, and the separation of powers had been reaffirmed. Which brings us to Act Two. That's the presidency of Barack Obama. And the story takes a little different twist. As you know, President Obama actually kept and sometimes expanded many of the national security programs of the Bush administration, notwithstanding his railing against them during his campaign. Actually, I'm glad he did. But his own broad conception of executive power went beyond the, that of the role of commander in chief. He carried it into the domestic arena too, which the Constitution leaves primarily to Congress and to the states. Frustrated and disdainful of a Republican con Congress and impatient with the consensus building required of legislation, President Obama repeatedly took matters into his own hands. 2009, the Department of Justice quit enforcing certain federal drug laws. In 2011, the Department of Justice refused to defend the Defense of Marriage Act, a law passed by Congress overwhelmingly and signed into law by President Bill Clinton. And in 2012, the, the Obama administration announced it would not enforce provisions of federal immigration law against a class of roughly one million individuals illegally present in the United States. Now, we don't have the time, and you, you don't have the patience, I assure you, to talk about all of these, but let me talk about the last run, which has come to be known as DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. I want to talk about that just a minute. Well, recall Article I is clear that Congress, not the President, has the authority to fashion immigration laws. In fact, President Obama repeatedly, by one count in excess of 20 times, publicly said he didn't have the power to do what he did. In his own words, he said, I'm President, not King. But nevertheless, he went on to do it anyway. President Obama didn't just use prosecutorial discretion to avoid enforcing immigration laws on a case-by-case -case basis. DACA actually gave roughly 800,000 illegal immigrants a form of lawful presence, providing them work permits and other government benefits. So the president wasn't just failing to enforce the law by specifying, specifying such a large class and purporting to grant them affirmative relief. He was effectively rewriting the law. Now, I want to be clear. I am not criticizing the policy goal behind DACA. I'm not impugning the character of those who benefited from it. But I am most definitely criticizing the way it was executed and questioning the legality. I think President Obama's DACA decision was vastly different from what other presidents have done. It was altogether new. It was unilateral policy making by determined inaction. But what's so bad with doing nothing? Well, when you're president, it can be pretty bad. It means the president shirking his very duties. It avoids critical checks and balances. As you'd rather gather from uh, Federalist 51, James Madison would, would have been appalled, as would the drafters of our Constitution be, be, because the Constitution says the president should take care that the laws will be faithfully executed. Because if there's no problem with DACA, what's to stop a president from saying, well, let's not enforce our election laws and, so that non-citizens can vote? 
Or what's to stop a president saying that darn tax code is giving people migraines? So let's not enforce our tax code against Fortune 500 companies and, or corporate CEOs. Well, all of that's bad enough. But I believe it's, there's no coincidence that all of this has occurred during a time when Americans' respect for our core institutions has been on the, de on the decline. I would argue that actions like DACA, which is the clearest example of a president disregarding his duty, is part of the reason why. It fosters distrust and undermines public confidence in how our Constitution is supposed to work. Process matters, and it's not partisan. You got to play inside the lines, even when doing so means sometimes you lose the game, or sometimes you have to ride the bench until it's your turn. Going through the legislative process is hard. I promise you, it's hard. But if you persevere, what you get by consensus is bipartisan buy-in, which is critical in a republic such as ours. Make no mistake about it, what we're really talking about is the legitimacy of our institutions, including the institution of the presidency. What we're talking about is whether maintaining the system as a whole takes priority over short-term agendas. Well, that brings me to the final act in this story, which is the Trump presidency. Of course, we're only eight months in, and it's too early to tell what the president's legacy will be regarding executive power. But if you're willing to look, there are a couple of signs of hope, both for the presidency and for our nation. On DACA, for example, the president has rightly returned the debate and the authority over the program where it belongs, and that is to Congress. A second good sign is what happened here in the wake of uh, Hurricane Harvey just a few weeks ago, which has devastated large portions of this great city. The executive branch's response to the most catastrophic rain event in U.S. history was swift, and it was circumscribed by the law, and it respected other institutions and other levels of government as well. But the executive course was one and only one part of a bigger picture because Congress has our role to play as well. After working with members of the executive branch, Senator Cruz and I, along with the entire Texas delegation, were able to secure a down payment to help Texas recover from Hurricane Harvey of 15 and a quarter billion dollars. Now, I'm a fiscal conservative, and numbers like that scare me to death. But when you look at the size of the, of the violence and the devastation wrought by Hurricane Harvey, as I tell my friends in Washington, I say Texas doesn't want to be treated any better than anybody else under similar circumstances, but we will not tolerate being treated worse. So we have a role to play, but there is a role also played by police officers, firefighters, our National Guard, and other military personnel. This is the state government led by Governor Abbott, who I thought did an extraordinary job and the men and women who work in that emergency operations center in Austin, Texas, led by Chief Nim Kidd, a remarkable leader. But as you've heard as well and seen with your own eyes, you saw the Cajun Navy, you saw neighbors helping neighbors, and, and just an extraordinary sort of way, which I like to think um, demonstrates the best of what uh, it means to be a Texan. After the uh, terrible explosion in West Texas a couple of years ago, I had a commissioner of, a, of the court, county court, uh, come to, I ran into him um, and he said, you know, he said, being a Texan doesn't just describe where you're from, being a Texan describes who your family is. And I always remember that at times like this, and I think we demonstrated that again in the wake of Hurricane Harvey. We all waded into the muck and pulled each other up hand by hand. Well. For a few days, we saw what Lincoln might have called the better angels of our nature, people of all stripes, including our chief executive, lending a hand. Well, that's not to say that uh, it's been easy for folks here in Houston or across the state that are still recovering. But I do think Hurricane Harvey represents just one lesson of how our democracy is supposed to work and how the different branches of government, from state 
federal and local, as well as within the federal government, can work together for the benefit of our people. Well, it's also important to remember, as my story demonstrates, that executive power is human, it's imperfect, and like all forms of power, it can be used for good or ill. Well, the response to the hurricane shows that it is only when the executive works in tandem with the rest of the government and we the people, it's only then that we are strong enough to take on anything and confront any challenge, even the fury of Mother Nature herself. For our democracy to work, it needs citizens who believe in it and a government that believes in them and an executive that even during difficult time has respect for each of our proper roles. With that, let me say my door is always open to you. Thank you again for the honor of speaking this afternoon, and may God continue to bless this great republic and bless the great state of Texas. Thank you. Senator Cornyn has, uh, would like to uh, take some questions from the audience. I know that we have a couple of handheld mics that are available to pass around. We may have our first question already identified. <laughs> <laughs> and otherwise, if you can get the attention of those who have the mic, we will proceed from there. Senator. Okay. Uh, thank you, Senator. I'm Kathy Glass from Houston, Texas. Um, as you consider future uh, appointees to the Supreme Court. I hope you will keep in mind Justice Scalia's dissent in the Oberfeld case when he said, and I paraphrase, it matters little to me how government defines marriage, it, but it is of paramount importance for me to know who rules me. And this decision says I am ruled by five out of nine unelected lawyers. And then he basically went on to say that the state should nullify the decision, although he didn't use that word. <laughs> Uh, I ask you to consider this as the premier characteristic we want to see in our judges and justices. That is, they know that this country was never meant to be ruled by judiciary. And this humility and understanding of our Constitution is what I want to see first and foremost above experience or uh, a friendship or anything else. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. I, Justice Scalia was... Uh such an extraordinary giant and somebody who I admired greatly. I even got a chance to go bird hunting with him one or two times, and he's a lot of fun uh, in that setting as well. You know, he famously said, and I'm paraphrasing here, that when people finally realize that there's a group of men and women um, who they can't vote for sitting on the bench uh, there at the Supreme Court uh, in Washington, D.C., who are substituting their value judgments for those of their elected representatives, they may well conclude that their own value judgments are superior to those of the value judgments of those unelected judges. I'm paraphrasing, but I'm confident that's the gist of what he, what he said. Uh, that is what I, when I think about the Federalist Society, that's what I think about uh, first, is your fidelity to that principle, which of course, as you can tell from my remarks, I agree with wholeheartedly. In the back of the room. Thank you for joining us, Senator. Thank you for joining us, Senator Cornyn. Um, I live in Virginia and I work in D.C. Uh, I live in Virginia and I work in D.C. And as someone who travels into D.C. every day, one thing I really appreciate is that you introduced the National Reciprocity Act. Um, so I wanted to ask, do you, do you see that passing this term? Um, I read the other day that Paul Ryan said he thinks it might not be time. Um, do you think that is the case, how he feels? Can we expect to see that before the midterms? Um, and is Chuck Grassley going to change the blue slip, blue slip policy and allow us to get some circuit court nominees confirmed? Well, I'll answer the gun question first. That's easier. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, you know, look, I think, um, I think I have a license to carry. I was just talking to Judge Elrod about it, and there are folks at the table. And, you know, I think uh, we don't have to be afraid of people who are lawfully um, using firearms and who uh, use them responsibly. 
And to me, the idea of a, a driver's license is very analogous. If you've got a license to carry from your state, then I think you ought to be able to use it in any other state who also recognizes a license to carry. And truthfully, all 50 states have some form of that. Some people might say, well, guns are different. It's a dangerous instrumentality. Well, it's no more dangerous than a car. And uh, we allow people to drive all over the, all over the country. So uh, on blue slips, I think Chairman Grassley has been very careful about that because obviously anything you do establishes a precedent for everything else in the future. And I've been in the Senate in the majority. I've been in the Senate in the minority. I much prefer the majority, by the way. Um, <laughs> But um, I think the, the principle of consultation between the White House and the Senate is really important. I don't believe that the blue slip was ever intended to give a, a senator a veto, particularly over a circuit court nominee, um, that the president is determined to nominate. And so I think uh, what uh, Senator uh, Franken is getting ready to find out is that by abusing the privilege of the blue slip, that encourages that consultation, he's going to see uh, that abuse rewarded with uh, the nomination going forward despite his objection. He'll be able to debate and argue and vote against the nomination, but he won't be able to uh, stop it. So the blue slip will continue to be used, but again, not, with, uh, not, not abused, in my view. Uh, hello, uh, I have spoken to many people over the past several months about the DACA program. And one of the things, unfortunately, that I have picked up on is that very few people know the actual on the ground facts of how our immigration system actually works. Um, it's compl complicated. It, it, it is, it, it very much is. And my question for you is that, uh, do you think some of the, the heat and anger of the DACA debate or of similar debates would be lessened if we actually had an adequately uh, funded and efficiently, efficiently administered uh, in immigration apparatus? Well, I bear the scars of, uh, of the immigration debate over the last 15 years, and we've had a lot of them, and they, they evoke a lot of passion and a lot of emotion, and we haven't gotten anything done. So I think the, by the president um, sending this back to Congress, uh, I think he's done us a favor. I think he's done the nation a favor and forcing us to deal with the most sympathetic cohort of uh, illegal immigration in the country. I bear no ill will uh, to children who came with their parents when they were of tender years. They're certainly not culpable. I think no court would convict them. Um, of any, any offense. And so the question is, are we going to keep them non-productive and dependent because they're not going anywhere, or are we going to give them a chance to, to, to rise and to get an education and be productive? And I would much prefer the latter uh, than the former. But I do think it's important to, to uh, have a negotiation which gets something very real and significant in terms of enforcing the law as it exists and securing the border. And I just happen to have a bill uh, that does all that. Uh, <laughs> and so um, we're working with the, uh, we'll be, we're talking now in the Judiciary Committee and with the various combatants and with the White House to try to figure out if there's a deal to be had. I think the deal is sort of there staring us in the face uh, once people are willing to acknowledge it. My own view on immigration is people are so irate at the lawlessness involved in our immigration system, illegal immigration system, that it hasn't allowed us to have a civil discussion about what sort of immigration policy makes the most sense for the United States. Some of my colleagues, Senator Perdue and Senator uh, Cotton, have a, um, a proposal they call the RAISE Act, which actually would move to more of a merit-based system. That is, what attributes does the immigrant have, which would actually benefit our country as opposed to just family relationships, which is the bulk of immigration, as you know, today. So the United States nat naturalizes about a, a million people a year. We are far and away the most generous country on earth when it comes to legal immigration. But I think people have a right to be outraged about the unwillingness to enforce our immigration laws. And if we don't like them, then we need to change them. 
But I think uh, that's the sort of debate which I think President Trump is, uh, I'm, I'm happy that he's initiated with the discussion about uh, DACA. Hi, Senator. Thank you for being here. Uh, so at the beginning of this Congress, Speaker Ryan indicated that one of the top priorities would be reasserting Article I powers, particularly with respect to delegation to administrative agencies. I'm wondering if you could discuss any kind of legislation we can expect coming down the pipeline uh, towards that end. Well, during the first few months of the uh, Trump administration, we've gone through a number of Congressional Re Review Act um, proceedings. This is something that within a certain time period after regulations have been issued, Congress can basically vote to disapprove of those, and we've done that on a targeted case-by-case -case basis. I'm hopeful with the, uh, with the new agency heads and the cabinet members, I was talking to Marcella about uh, her, her new job and working at the EPA, and with these new agency heads, hopefully they can go back and do review of uh, some of the existing regulations and propose changes that make sense. Um, so I think that's a very important part of it. You know, now with the, having the White House and having majorities in both houses, I think we're in a much stronger position to do something about this, particularly with the cabinet that the president's nominated than we were when President Obama was president, obviously, because he was, he was extraordinarily resistant. And I think some of, the, some of the excitement that you've seen in the economy, certainly with the stock market um, and elsewhere, people have more confidence that Congress is going to become more rational when it comes to regulation, and I hope taxation, which is what we're going to be taking up here between October 1st, roughly, and, and Thanksgiving, trying to reform our, our tax code. Um, there's a number of other pieces of legislation I know Rand Paul has, has been uh, proposing. Um, I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head, but there's a, there's a, lot, there's a lot going on in this space. But certainly, uh, trying to figure ways to deal with that fourth estate uh, of government, which is largely unaccountable, and um, you know, I, I'd love to see the, uh, I'd love to see the Supreme Court revisit the Chevron um, uh, test or rule. Um, Judge Gorsuch got a few questions about that. I can certainly understand why, uh, why judges would want to defer to uh, expert agencies when it comes to matters within their purview or perhaps even the facts underlying their decision. But the idea of judges deferring to administrative agencies on their own legal authority strikes me as an abdication. And I think those are decisions for judges to make and not for bureaucrats. Questions? Well, I have a, I have a question, yeah. if that's all right. It's a very technical question, Senator uh -oh. Cornyn. Um, what did your wife say when you wanted to leave the Texas Supreme Court to run for Attorney General? Have you lost your ever-loving mind? <laughs> I, can't, I can't remember, but, but she has said, and uh, Charles noted that I've been married 37, coming up on 38 years, that she said, when I married you, you were a lawyer practicing in San Antonio, Texas. I thought I was going to have a very normal existence. I wasn't going to move and be separated from my family and friends. And she got uh, just the opposite. And I was, I was a little worried when she said this early on in our marriage that, you know, she might be seeking some sort of an annulment based, <laughs> based on a misrepresentation on my part. But she has been an extraordinary trooper, and I would not be uh, privileged to do what I'm doing today if, if it weren't for her. Thanks for asking. Yeah, Gene Meyer. Um, I, want, I wanted to follow up on the blue slip thing for a second. What... Uh, does this work, work, in your view, as a process of, 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 of negotiation where you basically say, I, I saw with, with the Oregon nomination, um, some, some Democratic legislators wrote the senators saying, Democratic senators saying, look, we're going to lose this seat altogether if you don't cut it out. They didn't phrase mm -hmm. it that way. But, mm -hmm. um, uh, but is, it, it, it does seem as though, you know, the, the, the way in which this is negotiated is probably going to be key, mm -hmm. not only to getting people through, but also to not giving up three quarters of the store in the process. Yeah. Um, has, has, have there been a lot of discussion with the leadership on that? Yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not going to let um, pe senators veto the president's choices when it comes to nominees, uh, especially the circuit courts. 
Now, you know, district courts are treated, have historically been treated a little bit differently, but as I indicated earlier, I think that consultation is helpful and useful, and certainly when there's a Democratic president and I'm in the minority, I'm gonna want to be consulted as well. Um, I think advice and consent includes that sort of consultation. Um, but I do think it's going to be handled on a case-by-case -case basis rather than a, across the board. As I indicated, uh, Senator Franken has decided to pick this fight. Uh, he will lose it. Um, but I don't think, uh, I think it's just a warning to others that this is a sensitive matter where the, um, there, are, there needs to be some uh, cooperation. You've seen that uh, a willingness to use the uh, so-called nuclear option when it comes to uh, super majorities uh, having to get cloture in order to confirm judges with 51 votes. Now that's returned to the status quo uh, before 2000 when nobody dreamed we'd use the filibuster to stop a judge's uh, or a president's judicial nominees. So I think that's, I, I don't uh, lose any sleep over that. But I do think it's important to try to prever preserve as much collegiality as we can in the Senate because there are only a hundred of us and what we do today will come back and haunt us uh, in a year or two from now if we're not careful. So we just need to be thoughtful about it. And I think handling this on a case by case basis uh, makes sense right now. Yes, sir. Senator, um, building off your last uh, response a little bit, um, media likes to play up a lot of bipartisan divide, perhaps more than there actually is in the real world where you work. Um, you spend many, many years working on both sides of the aisle to, to get good work done. Thank and you. I just want to know if you had any advice um, to carry over from your world to the rest of us in terms of what we can do to decrease the bipartisan divide, to lessen the ire so that we can get the good work done. Well, thank you. Thank you for that. I'm, I'm proud of the fact that we've been, um, we've, We've tried to work in a civil uh, fashion with our colleagues with whom I agree, with whom I agree uh, on very little uh, from a policy standpoint. Um, I still remember the story of Mike Enzi, who was the uh, conservative senator from Wyoming, still is, and Teddy Kennedy, the liberal lion of the Senate. They were the chair and ranking member of the Senate Help, Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee when I came to the Senate. And I said, how do you guys work together so productively? You guys are polar opposites when it comes to ideology. And Mike would told me, he said, well, it's just, it's simple. It's the 80-20 uh, rule. Uh, we try to find the 80% we can agree on and then f leave the 20% for a fight another day. But I, I honestly think um, my, uh, my law practice and my work uh, both in the district courts and Supreme Courts have served me well in terms of preparing me for my current job. Because, uh, you know, what did uh, Shakespeare said be as advocates in the court strive mightily but eat and drink as friends? Every disagreement doesn't have to be a personal disagreement. And uh, not every disagreement is about a matter of principle. I believe on matters of principle we should stay, be steadfast and not waver. But a lot of things that we do and disagree about are not. And I think we ought to look for ways to, do, to, uh, uh, to try to figure out how to get along. As a practical matter, um, uh, as Al Franken said, I don't normally quote Al Franken, but he was, down at, <laughs> he was down at the Texas Tribune Fest in Austin yesterday, and he noted that you can't actually get things done in Washington uh, unless it's on a bipartisan basis. So people who try are going to be enormously frustrated, and you have to just figure out a way to deal with the system as it was designed. And yes, it was designed to make it hard. It was a part of the design. Um, people value their liberty and realize that if you uh, make it too easy for the legislature or the government to uh, deprive you of your liberty uh, in the absence of a consensus building process, then it would be, uh, it would be very, very dangerous indeed. Thank you very much. Is that, you got another one? We have what time? Okay, one let's do it. I got all the time in the world. And, and we will uh, I just wanted to be respectful of your time. Senator Cornyn, my name is Dr. John Fraser. I'm a pediatrician who has had the privilege of taking care of sick and injured Texas children for three decades. My question is, why can't the Congress fix the mess in health care? Uh, I can tell you I've gone from a, a time where I could see children quickly and just do documentation that was meant for me and other physicians. Now I 
take five minutes to see someone. It takes me 15 minutes or more to close a chart so that third party intervenors can get paid and collect big data on mass populations. And uh, that's not taking care of my, my patients. And I, yeah. I'm, I'm really concerned that it's not being addressed. Well, doctor, uh, as I've indicated in my remarks, I cut my teeth defending physicians in malpractice lawsuits. And uh, uh, so I had a chance to work in and around the medical profession a lot. And, and what you just said, I've heard repeated so many times. And I know it's an enormous frustration. And in many ways, government's made your job much harder and not easier. And one of the ways government's made it harder is to try to nationalize and um, our, our healthcare system. It's a very big and important part of our economy, about a sixth of our economy. But what we saw with the Affordable Care Act is a national experiment. And I believe the experiment is by and large failed, certainly failed to deliver on the promises the president himself made when he sold it. Like you, if you like your doctor, you can keep your doctor. If you like your plan, you can have your plan and so forth. None of that proved to be true. And in the process, what we've seen is a system that uh, has increased premiums in the individual and small group market by 105 percent since 2013 alone. The projection for next year is another double digit, 20, 30 percent increases. And I know that the uh, government uh, being uh, so involved in, uh, in health care has not made the practice of medicine any easier. And physicians, my experience, just want to be able to treat their patients. And uh, the rest is just uh, part of the price you pay uh, for being able to do that. Uh, unfortunately, our, the health care debates have become extraordinarily polarized. One of the reasons was that uh, I remember the Christmas Eve in 2009, 7 o'clock in the morning, when the Affordable Care Act was passed with 60 uh, Democratic votes in the Senate and passed by Nancy Pelosi in the House and, of course, later signed by President Obama. That created an environment where the whole debate became so toxic and we became so far removed from the facts and people became more engaged in a proxy war on who you supported and who you opposed. Um, I thought that was kind of surprising and shocking, but when I talked to pollsters and people who do focus groups, they said, well, if people are supporters of President Obama, then they're going to defend Obamacare to the death. If they oppose the president and his policies, then they're going to be critics and you're not going to be able to change their mind either. So to me, that started us down this unfortunate path that we're continue to be on today. Uh, as you know, we're considering taking up some legislation by Senator Graham, Senator Cassidy, that would largely return a lot of the money and authority back to the states, because I think the states are more trusted, uh, state and local government, certainly than the federal government. And if you believe in federalism, as we all do, then you believe that, um, that as much of that authority that can be devolved to the states um, would be good almost in any aspect of government. Um, government closest to the people is always going to be more responsive to the people, whether you're a city councilman or whether you're a legislator or whether you're the governor. So I hear you, and I, I wish us luck, uh, but uh, this, is going to be a, this is going to be a battle, ongoing battle, for quite some time until we finally get to a point where either both sides are exhausted or we just finally realize that what we've been doing is not working for the benefit of the American people and we need to come up with a different approach. Okay. Thank you. Please help me thank Senator Cornyn.